the greatest supporters of life that I know of in our nation. He's a man with such capabilities that uh, you remember well that we voted for him in 2008 in the presidential election. And unfortunately, he was second place as the Republican candidate. Mike Huckabee is a well-known host of the television show of TBN Huckabee. He served as 44th governor of Arkansas from 1996 to 2007. He's a tremendous man of God, a man who can preach, a man who can teach, and a man who can address the issues better than anybody that I know of. And we're blessed tonight to have Governor Mike Huckabee with us. Would you give him a big welcome? Bill, that was as gracious and kind an introduction as I think I've had. And I want to be honest with you, it's a lot better than some I'm getting these days. <laughs> um, you know, I used to go places and I would get these flowery introductions. And I'd sit there and listen, I'd think, I didn't know I was that great a guy. <laughs> and then, um, over the last year or two, I don't get those anymore. That's why I really appreciate what you said. Because now I go places, instead of all this biographical material, people just get up and say, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker tonight is Sarah's dad. <laughs> That's it. That's all I get. And I couldn't be happier about it, because no parent is ever jealous of his or her child's successes. Uh, I actually have two other children, just so you know. Sarah's not the only one. She's just the one who is uh, a bit more famous, and I got asked a couple of days ago, do your sons get jealous that Sarah's getting all this attention? And uh, I, I'm quite honest with them, say no. Uh, they've been around political fame for a while, and quite frankly, they know it ain't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> well, I want to be uh, very clear to you tonight. I love Pendle. I want to tell you why. I truly do. You. You've so welcomed me, and you've been so gracious that it's easy to love the people of Pendleton, Oregon. And I'm really grateful that you have given me the opportunity to be in your community. It's a wonderful community. And I got to go by and see the, uh, well, there's one person like that. <laughs>
I had to be in Charlotte, North Carolina last night, and I've got to be in Las Vegas tomorrow. It's a speech, it's not quite. <laughs> very clear about that. And I said, I could do it on the 25th if it's at all possible. And as it worked out, it was a God thing. And I want to report that uh, we, were, we were spared. The hurricane was pushed a little further east than it was originally projected because of a, uh, a front that was coming from the west. We were grateful for that. And we were on what's called the left side of the hurricane. Because as a hurricane comes in, it moves in a counterclockwise direction. So most of our 80 to 100 mile an hour wind was much less than the 150 mile an hour wind that just decimated Mexico Beach and a good bit of Panama City, which is only about 20 miles east of us. What we ended up with was north wind, and our house was okay. We had neighbors that came and sheltered with us because they'd been through hurricanes and thought, ah, this isn't gonna be any big deal. When it escalated to a four, I started getting calls at 5 a.m. Wednesday. If that offer to come over to your house is still good, I'd like to do it. And so uh, we ended up having folks come. We're fine. <clears throat> My wife has spent every day since the hurricane uh, over in Panama City working in disaster recovery and relief. And it's, just, it's just been enormous what, what the challenges are. But I wanted to tell you something. Now, every community in America would be as kind, understanding, as gracious as you were. And I really want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to be home with my wife and my two dogs. Um, I don't know that she was all that glad I got home, but I really was. <laughs> and it, it just is indicative of what kind of folks you are. But as I got here today, I realized that's just who you are. That's what you're about. This is the kind of community in this country that has made America a wonderful place to live. The heart and the soul of this nation. It's not surprising that you have something like pregnancy care services in what is really a relatively small community to have an organization like this to serve your community. I'll be honest with you, very few communities I know that are even two or three times the size of Pendleton have something that is specifically geared toward helping women make a decision to take care of their babies. Please know that you're doing something that in and of itself is extraordinary. And I really do appreciate that. And I'm delighted to be able to see that kind of spirit that lives in your community. But again, I'm not surprised now having come and spent some time in getting to know many of you. But you're making a difference. Now there's someone here tonight that I want to acknowledge because he's making a huge difference. This is not a political event. I know that. And you know that. I'm not here to be full of it. Look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I tell everybody, Donald Trump was not my first choice for president. I was my first choice for president. But he was my second choice. And I, I really appreciate it, especially what he's done in the life world. Because, frankly, there's no president in my life, not none, who has been as consistent who has been as bold, and who has done as much to protect and preserve human life as this president. Now, would I like to have been there? Obviously I would, that's why I ran. I'm amazed when people come up to me and say, well, he ran for president. I don't guess you really thought you would get there. <laughs> Can I tell you a little secret? Nobody runs for public office in order to lose. <laughs> So you'd never say that to a person who ran for office. But I'm not the only one here who's had the guts to put his name on the ballot and his neck on the line. Congressman Greg Baldwin is here tonight. I got to know him a few years ago. And I admired him on several levels. But tonight, his stock with me rose way higher, and I want to tell you why. If you know anything about serving in Congress, especially in the House, for every event that he actually can make on his calendar, there's 50 that he has to say no to, at least. Because every community in the district wants him to come for a ribbon cutting or an event of some kind, make a speech, show up at something. 
And so he only can do a few of the things that he's asked and invited to do. That's where Congressman Walden decided to be tonight. With you. Now, it's not about the fact that he showed up where there's a crowd, because there's a lot of politicians that would never, ever darken the door of an event like this because they're afraid that they might get labeled really seriously pro-life. And they want to be just enough pro-life to not offend the pro-life community, but not enough that they might be identified as somebody who really took it seriously. Here's what I want you to recognize. Your congressman is with you tonight. Not out of convenience, out of conviction. I cannot tell you how much that means to me, how appreciative I am of his presence here tonight and what it says, not just about him, but about you, that he values what you do, that he comes here not to be seen, but to say to you and affirm of you that what you're doing in this room tonight is important for the people of Oregon. Congressman, would you stand up? You have no idea how important this is for you to come and to be here with these folks and to give them the affirmation of your presence. And I hope that it's not lost on anyone here that there are very few members of Congress who would come to an event like this and be a part of it. And what a great, great thing it is. Now, we're here tonight because we'd like to see us raise about $300,000 to be able to get an ultrasound machine which, by the way, is the single greatest tool that has ever happened to save the lives of unborn babies. Because it's hard to look at the picture of a baby and an ultrasound and say, no, I don't see a person there. I just see a blob of tissue. You see a baby. And a few moments ago when Cindy showed you some of those pictures, I don't think anybody here said, eh, I can't really make out that that's human. Yes, she could. Of course she could. And it's why you're here. Now, we can get out of here a lot earlier tonight. If anyone would like to stand up and say, uh, Governor Huckabee, I'll write a $300,000 check right now. <laughs> I'm going to wait just a moment if anybody would like to do that. <laughs> okay, I'll give the speech. There you go. I could have ended this thing right here. <laughs> if at any point during my comments tonight you say that's all I can take, just stand up and say, here's 300000 I'm doing it right now. And we'll all be grateful. We'll shake your hand, hug your neck, and send you on your way. Then you will save lives right here in Pendleton. But I don't know that any one person will do that. If you can, that'd be great. But it may take the efforts, the sacrifice, the prayers, and the commitments of everybody here and that's okay. I want to make it very clear. One of the things that will hopefully happen tonight is a significant amount of money that will be raised. And hopefully it will be the 300000 that meets those goals of being able to operate this organization 40 hours a week, put the ultrasound in place, to be able to expand the ministry, and that's what it is. It's a ministry not only to the unborn child, but to the women that are Oh, there's two victims in every abortion. The obvious one is the baby, but the other victim, and we need to never forget this, is that birth mother who often was talked into it by a friend or maybe by a mother or, or a grandmother or by a boyfriend or by a husband. And later, when guilt is eating them alive, they become the second victim. 
And I love the fact that one of the things that this organization does, it not only seeks to minister to and to save the life of the unborn child, but it hugs with great love and compassion the birth mother and affirms her and ministers to her needs and treats her with the respect and the dignity that she needs and deserves at a time like this. And that's one of the reasons that you can feel good about what you're doing to help this organization continue to reach the women and save the babies. Now, I'm guessing something here tonight. I'm guessing that if on the way home you saw an accident and somebody's life was in danger, you would stop and help. I'm pretty sure you would. I mean, most of us, if we could save a life, we would do it. I was at EMT in college. I learned some things, CPR. And another thing I learned was the Heimlich maneuver, which is a maneuver that you may have learned, and it's how to help someone who is choking expel the food so that they live. And that's a critical and an acute emergency. If a person is choking and they don't get that help immediately, they will die. It happens every single day in this country. I was at a, an event for the North Carolina Republican Convention a few years ago. I was governor at the time. They had asked me to come make a speech. I was at their state convention. And it was a luncheon. It was about 1,200 people there. And they had a big head table up on the raised dais. And I was sitting on this side of the podium next to the party chair. And she was just talking away and chatting up. And on the other side, candidate for lieutenant governor. His name, Robert Pittenger. He later became a congressman served with Greg Walton. And he was sitting on the other side, and I looked up, and I saw Robert over on the back side of the stage like this, leaned over, and there was a guy who was kind of just gently patting him on the back. Well, it had been 35 years, but I knew intuitively what was going on. He was choking. And this guy patting him on the back wasn't going to do any good whatsoever. I'll just say bye-bye. <laughs> and so without even thinking, this is why you practice these things over and over and over again so that when you have to do them, you don't have to stop and think. You intuitively act. And I simply stood up and I just basically said, excuse me, to the lady who was still talking. I think she continued to talk the entire time I left. <laughs> and I went over and I just... I probably wasn't even nice about it. I pushed the gentleman out of the way. I reached around Robert and I said, trust me and relax, as if either of those things were possible at a moment like that. <laughs> but I reached around and I applied the Heimlich maneuver three times and up came the food that he was choking on. He had been sitting up there listening to a joke, got uh, really abused and, and some food went down the wrong way, choked his airway. He was already beginning to turn blue. Which is not a good sign, folks, if you're joking. When you're turning blue, you're not far away from getting ready to take the dirt nap, as we say in Arkansas. Some of you haven't heard that one, and you'll have to think about it. A <laughs> and as soon as I applied the kind of maneuver, he was fine. He caught his breath, he was okay, and uh, he went on to serve in Congress. I got a National Red Cross Life Saving. And uh, I mean, it wasn't that, to me, it wasn't that big a deal. Everybody thought it was so cool, except one person. His wife never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. Saving a life is an extraordinary thing. And if you can do it, you would do it. And if you weren't trained, you would still try. It's human nature, isn't it? You see somebody who's in stress, and you feel like you can intervene, you do it. We're not here tonight to raise money. We're here to save lives. And the life that you helped save tonight very well can be the life of your grandchild that hasn't even been born yet. Could it be his or her best friend? 
want you to realize that sometimes when you're shopping at a Safeway store and you see that mom pushing the cart and little baby's in there and it's so cute you can't help but just look over there and smile and even say something to the mother, you realize someday you're going to be pushing a cart at Safeway and you're going to see a little baby in that cart. You won't know it at the time, but when you get to heaven, God's going to let you know that you helped save that baby's life. Right here in Pendleton. Because it's not saving lives in New York City, Los Angeles, Detroit, or Orlando. And that would be fine, and that would be a worthy thing. We're talking about saving lives here in your hometown, where you live, where you care about these kids. I, I want you to be very clear. For me, pro-life has never been a political issue. I am not pro-life because I got into politics. I got into politics because I'm pro-life. Because I believe that nothing better represents who we are as a nation. Nothing better mirrors what we are as a people and as a civilization and as a culture than for us to affirm the worth and the intrinsic value of every single human being. Amen. Folks, this is fundamental to who we are as a nation. It was in our Declaration of Independence when our founders wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Which means they're so obvious we shouldn't even have to say them. But we will. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. And are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think about that for a moment. These guys were way ahead of their time. Because they came from a culture and they were breaking from a mother country that believed that your worth and value was tied to what your last name was or how much land you owned or your father owned or what kind of job you did or who was your relative. Do you realize how radical it was when they said all of us are created equal? Now they didn't say that all of us are the same. We all have different talents and abilities. Look, I came to the conclusion pretty much as a junior high kid that I was not a great athlete. I would have to find some other things to do. I realized I was never going to quarterback the Dallas Cowboys to a Super Bowl. I'm not sure anyone else ever will either right now, but I knew I would. Play. God did not say that we are the same, but he said we're equal. Because we've been endowed not by our government, but by our God. With certain unalienable rights, which means they cannot be taken from us. They're unalienable. They cannot be robbed, stricken from us. Because the government didn't give them to us. God did. And what are those rights? What is liberty? And it means there's no such thing as a disposable human life. There is no such thing as an expendable human life. There is no such thing as a worthless human life. And that's why every single little baby inside that mother's womb has worth and value because it's a worth and a value that came from God. And God has a purpose for that child. I cannot begin to tell you how grateful I am to live in a country that, that really believes in the equality of our worth and value. I grew up dirt poor in Hope, Arkansas, a little town that until Bill Clinton ran for president, nobody had ever heard of. He didn't really grow up there. He was born there, but he moved away when he was five. When he ran for president, he told everybody he was from Hope because it sounded good. I believe it was a place called Hope. And that sounded really good, right? And if you know where he actually grew up, it didn't sound so good because it would have been this. I believe in a place called Hot Springs. That's what he <laughs> I grew up in a town where nobody knew where we were. My mother grew up in a, a house during the Depression that didn't have a floor, just dirt. No electricity, no running water, just dirt. That's how poor it my ancestors were. And I'm not talking three and four generations away. I'm talking about the generation right above me. My dad never finished high school. His dad didn't either. 
And his death before him didn't either. In fact, there is not one male upstream from me in my direct lineage that had ever graduated from high school. Not one. I'm the first. Much less to go to college. When I was eight years old, my dad took me to hear a speech for the governor who came down to dedicate a lake. I'll never forget it. He said, now son, the governor's going to come down here and make a talk. That lake they built. And I'm going to take you down there to hear the governor make his talk. But son, you may live your whole life and you may never see a governor in person. <laughs> my dad could never have imagined if somebody said, well, now, now, you know, your boy will one day live in the governor's mansion. And he, he'd say, he may do the grass over there, but he ain't going to live there. <laughs> I mean, my dad was just a blue collar working guy that was a fireman, and then on his days off, he was a mechanic and he got his hands dirty. It's all he ever knew. Lifting heavy things, standing on the concrete floor, never having people wanting to come and shake his hand and know who he was. He just worked hard. We lived in a little orange brick shotgun rent house on 2nd Street in Hope, only place I ever knew. I thought, you know, if one day I could live in a house that had air conditioning, that had carpet on the floor, instead of those wood floors that you'd run through the house and get splinters in them. And I'll be long gone if I don't become an adult and everybody wants to go back to the wood floors. <laughs> I spent all my time trying to get away from it. We built our house. My wife said, I want to put wood floors. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> we got wood floors, by the way. <laughs> my dad was one of those guys, probably like a lot of your dads. He worked hard and he got his hands dirty. And no matter how hard he tried to wash those Moments of that hard work off, he could never quite scrub it out. I tell people, the only soap I had in my house growing up as a kid was lava. Some of you actually know what that is. <laughs> I'll put it to you like this. Folks, I was in college before I found out it's not supposed to hurt when you take a shower. <laughs> you know, I see women, they'll go to a spa and they'll spend several hundred dollars getting an exfoliation. Bar a lava will do the same thing. <laughs> but men, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you dare come up Valentine's and hand your wife a bar of lava and say, Here, baby, go exfoliate yourself. Because <laughs> you're going to lose some of your skin and lava won't even be involved. In <laughs> you see, I'm pro life not just about the babies. People say, You're anti abortion. I said, No, you don't understand. It has nothing to do with abortion. It has to do with the affirmation of every single human life. I believe that that life is a human being from the moment of conception until the end of its conclusion of life. And the reason I believe it is because it's biologically, scientifically a fact. From the moment of conception, there's a DNA that has been created that has never existed before and it will never exist again exactly like that. This is a human being. At that moment it is. And here's the thing. Somebody says, well, it's just a part of a woman's body. Then how come it doesn't automatically have the same blood type? How come the DNA is not a direct match? This is not an appendage of the mother. This is a life. And it's unique. And it's God-given. And it has extraordinary potential. And it has the equal worth and value of any other human life. I don't care how rich a kid may grow up to be. I don't care how good looking, how gifted and talented he or she may be, that child is no more worth something to God than is the child who grew up so dirt poor. Nobody knew his or her name, and they never have much of a shot at life. I'm telling you to God they're of equal value. I'm telling you tonight that the child with Down syndrome is as precious in the eyes of Almighty God as the captain of the football team.
We have two children. We love them all. Sarah is our only daughter. She may be the most famous, but she's not the only one we got. She had two older brothers. And when people say, where did Sarah get that toughness? Sometimes I'll say, have you ever met her mother? <laughs> I don't say that when she's around, but I'll say that sometimes. <laughs> but what I really say is this. She had two older brothers who were incredibly mean to her. And she, as a little kid, had to decide that if she was going to survive, she's not going to fight. They were mean. And she'll tell you today, it's the best thing that ever happened to her, because it made her tough. And it made her realize that she doesn't have to just let people roll over her. And she doesn't. In fact, I'll tell you something. I realize I'm in Oregon, but if you ever are talking to a Southern woman, and she begins or ends a sentence with these three words, it may be explicitly stated, it may be implicit, but if she ever starts or ends the sentence with these three words, I'm telling you now, look out, here's the three words. Bless your Because if you ain't from the South, you probably think that means it's a term of endearment and kindness. If a Southern woman starts or ends a sentence with bless your heart, you are about to be gutted like a deer. And she'll do it with a sweet smile on her face, and you'll look down and say, what just happened to me? We value life because there's no such thing as a life in the important thing. Nobody in this room is expected. Nobody in this room is disposable. Nobody in this room is unimportant. Nobody in this room lacks worth and value. And nobody in Pendle, even the baby that is but a few days from conception, lacks worth and value. And tonight your presence says, care about anything. And you care about the mother. And you can start your own organization, but you don't have to because there's one that's already here. It'd be a heavy push to lift it up from the start. You don't have to. All tonight, really, we have to do is keep pushing in the direction of the one that is already in motion and give it a boost and help it to have the ultrasound sound equipment so that that young lady who comes in and sees that picture, over 80% of the time, a young lady who sees an ultrasound will not have an abortion because she's maternal enough to realize that's a life and it's in me. When Sarah told that story about the, foot, uh, the baseball player, I turned to Dan and I said, that's a great story. I, I mean, I was tearing up. Because I'm thinking, if you can just take this little model of a baby and say, this is a 12-week-old unborn child, and bring a baseball player, a big, tough athlete, to tears, imagine what you could do with an ultrasound machine in your community that is available where somebody doesn't have to go to Portland or Bend or somewhere else to see an ultrasound. They can see it right here in Templeton. I'm telling you, it will save lives. You will save lives. You may not get a Red Cross Life Saving Award. You may never be honored at the White House with a special ceremony. But in heaven, God will single you out and thank you for the saving of a life that he already had placed a great value on. And tonight, when you make a commitment, what you're doing is saying, I join with the Father in value after human life in heaven. I just can't imagine why someone wouldn't want to be a part of that. I want to tell you something. Pregnancy care services does not get one dime from the government. I love Congressman Walton, but if he tried to bring money to this organization, you know what they would say? No, thank you. He wouldn't do it because that's not how he rolls. But they wouldn't accept it because they knew that if they did, they would also have the control of the government to come with it. They'd rather have God's control and your investment than they had to have the government making these decisions for these young ladies. And if you don't do it, nobody else will. That's why. 
It's important. Several years ago, there was a father who wanted his, wanted his daughter and his other children to really understand something about what happened to the Holocaust because he felt like that maybe they would grow up in a world where they wouldn't believe it happened. Or they would grow up at a time when they thought that it was just one of those things that happened to He took his children to God Bashem in Jerusalem. It is the memorial dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust. 11 million people murdered by the Nazis. 6 million of them Jews. Murdered not because they were evil people and not because they were criminals and not because they had done something bad they hadn't committed terrorism. These were teachers and shopkeepers and musicians and, and just decent people that lived in their communities and lived their lives, raised their families. They became targets for Hitler's third right. And he systematically murdered six million Jews. And Yad Vashem is dedicated to their memory. The father took his children. His little girl was only 11. He was really concerned that she was too little to understand it, but he knew also that he hoped that maybe she could get some semblance of why it's important that when people see something that is evil going on, that they don't just silently walk past, but that they speak up and they stand up and they try to stop. So the father took his little girl to Yad Vashem. He hoped that somehow that she would vividly see what happens when people do nothing in the presence of people. As they walked to Yad Vashem, they saw the depiction of when the Jewish children were made to wear the star of David in their clothing in very vivid form. It was not to single them out for honor, it was to single them out for being bullied, isolated. Humiliating. The little girl was shocked that children five, six years old would be harassed like that. When they got to the part about Yad Vashem that was about the Warsaw Ghetto, there were pictures that showed how the Nazis would take the parents off in the death trains to concentration camps to murder them and to leave the children sometimes alone on the streets. And during the winter, their only warmth they could get was laying across the grate of a sewer. And the only food tossed from windows from sympathetic people in Poland who would give them something to eat. Many of them died of starvation. Many of them died from hypothermia, literally died frozen to death in the streets. Others of them were murdered by the Nazis who would take rifles and shoot them as sport. Now, if you think that maybe this is an exaggeration, it isn't, because the reason we know that the Nazis did this, actually shooting children as if they were targets, is because they were so proud of what they were doing, they took pictures of themselves doing it. I can't begin to even think about what a twisted mind would do something like that. The little girl saw the pictures of the death camps at Dachau, Bergen, Wilson, and the worst of all, Auschwitz Birkenau. In Auschwitz Birkenau, where 10,000 Jews a day were murdered, it was nothing more than a murder machine. Imagine creating an entire factory to do nothing other than kill Jews, 10,000 of them. And when there were so many of them, they couldn't keep them through the crematorium and burn their dead bodies and turn them into ashes, that they ended up just taking them by the thousands to pits on the edge of Birkenau. And on the pits, they would line them up, strip them of their clothing, and shoot them and use heavy machinery to push their bodies over into the pit, put some lime on them, and bring the next group in and shoot them and push them over. And there were so many bodies stacked up, it didn't even look like bodies anymore. It looked like sticks of lumber. The little girl saw these pictures. And the father hoped it wouldn't traumatize her, but he hoped that it would make an impression upon her. But this is what happens when evil goes unchecked. As they got ready to exit God Vashem. There was a guest book on a podium. The little girl went up to the guest book, took a pen from her father's pocket, and she wrote her name and address in the guest book. The father got behind his daughter, looked over to see what she was writing, and saw that she wrote her name and address. And then there was a place for comments. 
And the little girl paused, and then she started writing in a place for the comments that the father wanted to see what she would write. Eleven years old, did she get it? Had this, had this experience of being there gotten through to her? And he watched as his little girl wrote words that he would never forget. Because the little girl wrote these words in the book. Why did somebody do something? That's all she wrote. Why did somebody do something? It was inconceivable to her that something like this could be happening. And nobody would speak up and nobody would stand up and nobody would try to stop it. And in a way that only an 11 year old could cut through all the nonsense, all of the politics, all of the explanations, all of the justifications. She simply asked the question, why did somebody do something? And when she wrote those words, she put the pen back in her father's pocket. And she did not say another word for over five hours. But that father never again had to ask whether his daughter understood what it meant try to stop him. That little girl isn't a little girl anymore. Most days she goes to a different podium, not a Yad Vashem. She goes to a podium at the White House. That little girl is my daughter Sarah. I took her there. Don't you want to do that? I'm sure that you truly do. 